Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Laia Gask. I am the director of the World Cities Culture Forum. I am delighted to welcome you all today to showcase the work that we've been doing with Andani Africa, British Council and 10 African capitals. Our audience today is joining us from all across Africa, including Abuja, Addis, Dakar, Harare, Kigali, to name just a few, and also from all over the world, including Boston, Dubai, Rome, Tallinn, and Warsaw, and many, many more. In fact, we have a total of 93 different cities joining us today. Over the past 10 months, we have been talking to city and culture leaders in 10 capitals in Sub-Saharan Africa. Today, we will hear from Andani Africa on the research findings so far. There will be a panel discussion moderated by Ojoma Ochai, managing partner at CC Hub and friend of World Cities Culture Forum. She will be joined by leaders from Johannesburg, Lagos, Kampala and Nairobi and partners and friends from Africa No Filter. We will then open up for questions and answers from the audience using Slido. So you have to scan the, the QR code and send us your, uh, here we go, that's appearing on, on your screens. Scan the QR code, send us your questions, don't be shy, send questions away. We'll get try to get to as many questions as possible. We may experience some connection issues Hopefully not many, but uh, we have people joining from all over different, different parts of the world and connections may be patchy, including in London. Uh, so bear with us. But before we start, I would like to welcome Justin Simons for a message of welcome, our chair and funder. Over to you, Justin. Hello, I'm Justine Simons. I'm the founder and the chair of the World Cities Culture Forum and also London's Deputy Mayor for Culture and the Creative Industries. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all to the African Alternatives webinar, hosted in partnership with our friends at the British Council. The World Cities Culture Forum is a network of 42 global cities spanning six continents. Between us, we represent a total population of 245 million people. We are the leading international network of creative cities and civic leaders. We share our best ideas as equal partners, and we want voices from African cities to be part of our network. So today is a really important milestone on this journey. By 2050, the African population will double, and more than 80% of that increase will be in cities. We're very pleased that the World Cities Culture Forum is growing partnerships for the Africa network. Recently, we collaborated with the Creative Vibrancy Index for African Cities, launched in Nairobi. We're currently working with Andani Africa, engaging 11 capital cities in sub-Saharan Africa. And you are telling us about the opportunities and the challenges for cities and culture in the region, and how being part of a global network can benefit your cities and can benefit the rest of the world too. The World Cities Culture Forum has established the principle that culture is a golden thread in cities, supporting our communities, our health and well-being, attracting tourists and boosting our economies. And we have learned that by working together, we can unlock opportunities for culture to address our city's most pressing needs. Culture and the creative industries are our greatest asset, and we have the data to prove it. Here in London, four out of five tourists say the main reason they come here is culture. And one in six jobs here in the capital is in the creative industries. There's an opportunity for city leaders across African capitals to collaborate and to grow culture and the creative industries across the region. Today, we want to open up these conversations and ensure that your voice is part of our global network. So I want to thank our partners at the British Council and all the panelists for giving their time. Enjoy the session. Thank you so much, Justine. And now I want to hand over to Skinder Hundal, he is the Global Director for Arts at the British Council. He'll say a few words. Skinder has been critical to enable this work to happen. So thank you, Skinder. Over to you. Laya, thank you so much. You'll have to excuse my strange camera angle 
it's my phone because the laptop didn't work. Well, look, welcome everyone to African Alternatives, the future of creative cities. What an exciting moment as Africa's critical mass of creatives come together to shape new creative destinies and bring distinct vibrant frequencies transmitted and owned locally by globally connected African new generations with both urgent and important ambitions. The British Council team are delighted to be partnering with our hosts, the World Cities Culture Forum and partners and Dani Africa. I hope that you all learn and immerse yourselves today and you leave inspired and motivated to grow your creative mantras across your respective sites, wherever you are in the world and particularly in Africa. As a cultural relations organization, so we work with thousands of cities worldwide, so it is only fitting that we collaborate with our friends at WCCF to support dialogue that helps us to understand the changing nature of cities and the role creative people play in that. Today, as the title suggests, we wish to harness alternative perspectives and to use the session as an opportunity to shine a spotlight on unique vibrancy and creative ingenuity of African cities and their people. As cultural creative leaders, researchers, policymakers and city leaders, it is our role to enable, convene and help design the future space, to create the fertile ground, i.e. invest in culture, incubate, nurture and launch creative enterprises and talent pipelines has become increasingly vital. Also key is to share the impact with rigorous, credible research, data and insights as to how cultural creative economies and ecologies bump us out of stagnant states of societal and economic troughs. In the UK over the past two decades, there has been a growing realisation in the power of cultural and creative industries in terms of enriching lives, well-being, creating positive reputations about place and creating sustainable livelihoods protecting intellectual property and creative ideas. Recently, the Prime Minister with the Department for Culture, Media and Support, Sports and the Creative Industries Council launched the Creative Industry Sector Vision, which has been built on extensive consultation, research and impact studies. Jen, just quoting from the vision, it starts on the front foot. It says, our creative industries are world leading, an engine of our economic growth and at the heart of our increasingly digital world. From 2010 to 2019, they grew more than one and a half times faster than the wider economy. And in 2021, they generated 108 billion pounds in economic value, employing 2.3 million people, a 49% increase since 2011. So that and this is why in 2023, the creative industries are one of five priority sectors to deliver future growth. The creative industries in the UK are diverse and vibrant, and that is why they are recognised by the Prime Minister and leading politicians as playing an integral role in supporting growth through creating jobs and contributing to innovation that benefits wider sectors. And at British Council, our creative economy team with our research policy and insight unit for the arts collaborate with some of the best thinkers to determine quality data and evaluation to measure genuine impact. This research has transformed policy in major states and municipalities worldwide, be that in Indonesia, Korea, Mexico, Colombia, or the fastest growing economy, India, who will later this year host the G20 Leaders Summit, featuring the work of a G20 culture working group set up for the first time and supported by the research and insights from British Council. And of course, I've got to mention that creative cities have great people and great architecture. And you may be aware that British Council is the commissioner of the British Pavilion in Venice. And this year, it is the Architecture Biennale. And the theme of the pavilion touches on the expression of diaspora. And I hope some of you will have the opportunity to visit. And you will know, and you may not know, but you might know, is that in 2024, the great John Akamfra, the artist from Ghana, based in London, will grace the mighty portal city for creative expression in our pavilion. It's really exciting. Today's event will spotlight the British Council and World Cities Cultures Forum's latest research into sub-Saharan African cities 
and seeks, which seeks to further public understanding of culture and policy networks within the region. Today, we are building on our work with the Creative Vibrancy Index for Africa to capture the diverse ways in which these cities are supporting the creative industries and to inspire further growth and vibrancy. As African cities launch and boom with their own rocket fuel of creative ambitions and vibrant ideas and enterprises, let's then explore best practice in cultural policy in African cities, the role of the city leader supporting creativity and innovation, and how we build a collaboration between African networks within the creative cities. Good luck, engage, and rigorously enjoy. Over back to you, Leah. Thank you so much. We'll rigorously enjoy today. And thank you so much for your generous support and encouragement. I am now delighted to introduce you to our moderator today, Ojoma Ochai. Over to you, Ojoma. Thanks very much, Laya. Hi, everyone. It's very good to be here. I'm Ojoma Ochai, as has been said. I'm the managing partner of the Creative Economy Practice at CC Hub. We're an organization that works to uh, stimulate creative economy growth in Africa through research, ecosystem development, investment readiness, programming, investor advocacy, education, as well as investment ourselves into creative companies. I'm really pleased to be moderating this session that's focused on African cities as uh, models of creative cities. I think the, uh, the discussion is critical. It's timely and it's particularly apt, not least because of the Creative Vibrancy Index that has been talked about already, which is an index that we created to rank African cities based on their support for arts, culture, and the creative industries. I think it's also really critical in the context of what African cities are. As many of you probably already know, African cities are known for their cultural diversity, which is based on various historical factors, trade, migration, um, they're, they're quite diverse in terms of ethnicity, language, and culture. I think another really important thing with African cities, which makes this particularly uh, interesting, is that there's a unique trend in countries of Africa where many African countries have one city that stands out as the largest and most popular city and surpasses the next city by quite a large margin. And those cities tend to be quite prominent, not just in the country, but also in the region. As an example, Lagos, Nigeria, where I'm based, represents about 30% of Nigeria's GDP, a third, and Nigeria has 35 other states in addition to Lagos. But not only that, the GDP of Lagos as a city is greater than the GDP of Niger, Benin, Togo, Chad, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Gambia combined. So as a city, Lagos is quite a powerhouse in the region. But Lagos is not unique in that respect, right? We have other cities, Cairo in Egypt, Kinshasa in the DRC, Johannesburg in South Africa, Nairobi in Kenya, that are similarly mega cities that are significantly larger than other cities in, in the country. And so against that backdrop, I think when you also bear in mind that by the end of this century, 13 of the world's largest, uh, 20 largest cities will be in Africa. When you think about that, it makes this conversation particularly important. And so I hope that today's session will help us really think about how cities can support creativity and promote culture and use culture as a vehicle for achieving the different ambitions that cities have around regeneration, around wealth and job creation, and around opportunities for um, marginalized groups. The research that Andani has co co conducted has been talked about already. And so I think this is a good time for us to pause and listen to the research from Andani Africa to help us frame the panel discussion that we're going to hear today. On that note, quite happy to introduce Longwabo Mavuso, who's the director of Andani Africa and a longtime collaborator of the Creative Economy Practice. Always a joy to listen to you, Longwabo. I'll bring you in now for you to talk to us about the research findings. Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Ojoma. Um, 
As mentioned, I am from Andani, Africa, and we are a research and insights um, agency. Just maybe to um, give context around uh, the research. So we were commissioned by um, the World Cities Forum in partnership with British Council to do a review of the nature of cultural policy and how it may enable creative economy at city level, as well as provide recommendation for the establishment of the Africa program that will support city policymakers to grow creative economy in their cities with the aim of them joining the World Cities uh, Culture Forum. Um, if I go to the next slide. Just uh, the next slide again. Just in terms of um, the scope of research, we were commissioned to review 11 cities and the methodology that we use was mostly desktop research, interviews, surveys, and roundtable discussion, which were very engaging with um, city leaders, uh, policymakers, as well as cultural leaders. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. To give a sense of the broader context in the African city, we investigated and identified emerging themes, trends, challenges across multiple cities. These emerging themes are not necessarily cultural, but certainly cultural policy can play a mitigating role. As previously uh, mentioned, that uh, urbanization as is, is or rapid urbanization is one of the key challenges that are faced by city. This was very clear from the data that we collected that most cities felt that this is a real uh, concern and that the, urb the rapid urbanization does put a lot of pressure uh, within um, the city's infrastructure. And certainly uh, culture can play a mitigating role or enabling role to, to um, to ensure that cities are meeting some of the demands of the city. Certainly, uh, issues such as kind of, cult of, of place, meeting, place making, where cultural policy can enable those things, and also issues around job creations, where cultural policy uh, can enable through creative economy. Uh, so we see where um, uh, cultural, um, cultural policy can play an enabling role. Next, next slide, please. Um, many cities do not have cultural policy in place at local level, as we can see in the diagram. Four out of 11 cities reviewed have cultural policy in place. Those that do seldom review their policies, which are in many cases disconnected from practice and the realities on the ground or lacking implementation. Furthermore, what we found was that cultural and creative economy function and policy in this context often sits at national structures rather than local structures. And when they do exist at local level, they may be, they may be split across multitudes of departments within cities, which has the potential to be a main, which has the potential to mainstream culture in other areas, but also, uh, but also limit city buy-in and support when other sectors and issues are prioritized. If we can move on to the next slide. Key drivers and cultural policies in Africa. From, from a policymaker perspective, respondents were asked to rank what would be the drivers of cultural policies in order of priority. And this graph shows the number of policymakers who identify these as top five drivers in their cities. There's no surprise that um, creative economy and jobs, cultural tourism, heritage preservations and preservations and learning ranked highest among city policymakers. This demonstrates how culture can be used in cities to shape communities, contribute to the economy and job creation, foster inclusive and innovative and innovation, contribute to identity and well-being, and more. It is positive to note that this potential is being recognized by policymakers to a degree, but more can be done in this regard, certainly. Next slide. Then looking at trends and challenges identified in African cities in relation, to, in relation to culture. As we can see from this diagram, the major challenge is an adequate understanding of the role or potential of culture. This has a knock-on effect on the ability to create and implement effective cultural policy. What we found is that while policy makers understand the importance of culture from an individual perspective, there were challenges of application of culture and, and development of cultural policy in the context of mitigating of pressing issues at city, at city level. Certainly, improving access to information capacity, 
capacity development and network opportunities for creative and cultural stakeholders and policy makers could go a long way to improving this understanding and building relationship and trust to unleash the creative potential within cities. And I suppose as well, once we uh, unlock that potential and really work with city leaders, it can also enable uh, better kind of finding, uh, funding models to, to, to emerge from city levels. Next slide, please. Then from, uh, from network uh, benefit perspective, when we asked um, respondent, respondents, um, networking and peer support was the most attractive membership benefit. And this speaks to the challenge around the lack of collaboration and silo mentality, which was uh, shown in the previous slide. There is, there is certainly an appetite for collaboration and peer learning support. There's also a strong focus on research and learning, which makes sense considering the challenges around the lack of data on the continent, particularly in the creative, um, particularly in the creative and cultural sector, and the need to improve understanding of the value of culture and make informed policy and strategy decisions. And so perhaps uh, in closing, maybe just to talk through um, the next step. Um, so with regards to the next steps, so based on the research and in consultations for World Cities Culture Forum, Andani is compiling a series of recommendations for an African regional program within the World Cities Culture Forum network to meet the unique needs of cities on the continent and, and, encourage, and encourage African city membership and to feed into the broader global network activities. We are also working collaboratively on a fundraising strategy to bring uh, such a program to life. Our report on the world's cultural city will include suggest, suggested city leaders to be engaged further to grow the network on the continent. More details, uh, more detailed research findings will be shared publicly from, from September 2023 this year, including a presentation at the World Cities Forum Summit in Sao Paulo in October. Um, and that's uh, a snapshot of, of the, the findings of the research. As mentioned, a more detailed research, a more detailed research report will be made available to the public um, in September. Thank you very much, Longwabo, for that. Really interesting insights there on cultural policy and how cities uh, think a network will benefit them. Laya, would you like to comment on the research and maybe talk a bit more about next steps as well? Yeah, sure. I mean, thank you, Ojama, and thank you, Lonwabo, for really good, robust research that sort of hopefully is really helpful for the cities as well as for us. I think for us, this research demonstrates that African cities are leading a creative revolution. We've outlined sort of a bit more in detail the five reasons why we think that in our blog. You can check it on our website, on the news section of our website. But I'll just briefly outline the five reasons. Number one, the rapid growth of population in Africa cities. Ojoma, you've, you've mentioned that earlier on. Number two, the booming creative economy. Number three, there's infrastructure and huge talent, film, music, fashion, and more. Number four, increasingly governments are recognizing the power of culture to grow jobs, to attract tourism, to attract investment. Of course, a lot more work needs to be done on that, on that area, but there's sort of showings that governments are paying attention. And number five, which is for us a, a striking point, is the value of African cities working together. Uh, already the work that we did on the Africa Vibrancy Index showed the power of African cities working together and using data from different cities together. So I think for, now, for, for us, the next step is how do we use this data to advance a, a, a network of Africa cities to work together, to advance together? And importantly for us as well is how do we play that voice, that African voice in an international platform? you know, in the international community? How is that voice represented in the international community? 
that's why at World Cities Culture Forum, in terms of next steps, we will be presenting this research and we'll be inviting African leaders to our upcoming summit in Sao Paulo. Uh, and we will continue to develop partnerships. Um, but as I say, find out more on the blog on what our thoughts about next steps and why we think this work is so important. And I really look forward to hearing more uh, uh, from today's panel. And of course, it's an invitation to African cities to join the World Cities Culture Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laya. And thank you again, Lomwabo. I'm really looking forward to September and the release of the full report, as well as to Sao Paulo in October. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce the panel now. I've got quite an exciting uh, list of panelists from a range of African cities. First of all, I'd like to introduce Vuyisile Mshudulu, who's the Director of Arts, Culture and Heritage of the city of Johannesburg. Vuisile has experience of over 25 years in the creative industries working across policy development and promotion and development of the creative industries. Uh, he's also a specialist in cultural diplomacy and governance. Our second panelist today is Rachel Magola from the, she's a member of parliament in the Bugweri district of Uganda. And not only is she a member of parliament, she's also a renowned musician and she's known for her eclectic music. She's a songwriter, choreographer, dancer, and politician, my best kind of politician. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, Rachel is also the chairperson of the Parliamentary Forum for the Creative Industries in Uganda. And so really excited to have you here, Rachel. Yeah. Our third panelist is Sheila Oje. Good to see you, Sheila. Always, Sheila is the Director of Strategy, Partnerships and Stakeholder Management at the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund, which is an agency in Lagos State with a mandate to create a more enabling environment for job and wealth creation for Lagos residents. Sheila has example across various areas, including youth development, support for micro and small uh, medium enterprises across a range of sectors including the creative and digital economy. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you for having last, me. Last but not least is Victor Mark Onyegbu. He's the grants leader, Africa No Filter, and he oversees Africa No Filter's grant making strategy, as well as the programming in art, culture, and media. Victor has had a storied career across the creative industries, working for the British Council, as well as the Nigerian Arts Council, um, supporting arts and cultural development in Nigeria and now across Africa. It's really exciting to have you all with us this afternoon for the, the panel or evening, depending on where people are. And before I begin with my round of questioning, we do have a video from a fifth panelist, Stella Kemunto, who's from the Nairobi city government. And so we'll start with the video and then we'll jump straight into questions and proceed with the panel discussion. My name is Stella Kemunto from Nairobi City County Government. I'm the Assistant Director, City Culture, Arts and Tourism. Uh, the city leaders have more often put platforms for artists in the city to showcase and practice their arts and also they have given them opportunities to be able to understand that creative can earn them a living. What we can do is that we are going to set studios in the sub-counties of Nairobi so that all the creatives, those who've made their arts can record there and sell. But the city is not charging them on doing that. The city has also employed employees all over the Nairobi city county whereby in each sub-county, you'll get two officers from the City Culture Arts and Tourism who can guide you on what you need to do and who will tell you what is there in the city for them to do. The example where we have the city supporting the artists, the best which was achieved are two. One of them was the Nairobi Festival, which was held in December 2022. And then the next one is the Battle of Choirs. The Nairobi Festival 
there were platforms for artists to showcase. And then we were starting not for the established artists, but for the ones who are starting from scratch so that they can understand what they can do. And they were given, they were taught on what to do so that they can excel in their creative artists. They were told that it's not a must that when you are an, a creative person that you must be employed in an office to do your work, but you can do your stuff and sell it out there. In fact, we've noticed that creative builds more GDP in our country than any other work. The Battle of Choirs also gave the music a platform so that people know that music also sells. We noticed that the churches which do not have choir members were transporting choir members from other places to come and sing in their churches, which also makes somebody earn a living from that. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Stella Kamunto from Nairobi City Government talking about how the city of Nairobi provides infrastructure but also advisory and capacity building to support artists in Nairobi. So I'm going to jump straight into um, the, the, the questioning with the panelists. And I'd like to start with you, Rachel, because I think that you are our literal bridge between policy making and, and the arts and culture. And so I'd really like to hear from you, Rachel, how, what, what is it that cities offer in terms of driving change as it relates to urban development, youth opportunities, and so on. What is it that city cities can offer? And how does that differ from what countries, for example, can offer? I think the one thing that is uh, most obvious is the spaces, the theaters, the open spaces where festivals can happen, art galleries, uh, that's a start because if somebody has a place where they can practice their art or exhibit their work, then that's a start. So if the city in Kampala, for instance, we have the National Theatre, which uh, has been in existence for over 60 years now. Uh, of course, the UNCC Act needs to be changed because it was uh, written in 1959. And uh, when you said Little Bridge, that, <laughs> that tickled me completely because as, as an artist and, and, and uh, a legislator, my, my first agenda has been, what can I do? What can I do to change all these things that are not supporting the growth of the industry? So cities have got big opportunities to, to, to give artists and creative people places and opportunities. We do have festivals. We have um, one uh, very famous one is the Bayimba, the Bayimba Festival. We also have... Um, um Nyege Nyege festival in, in the city next to Kampala. And so every time these festivals are happening, it's it's huge. Everybody comes into the city. Performers are given opportunities to <coughs> exhibit their work if they are in the arts. They have the chance to perform in these festivals. So and then we also used to have uh, the Kampala City Carnival where different people are given opportunities to come and exhibit their art. That has been very, very helpful. Thank you so much for that, uh, Rachel. We see, Le, along the same tack, can, can you talk a little bit from a South African perspective, what is it that cities can offer in terms of the power of arts, culture, and the creative industries? How does this differ from what countries can offer? Well, thank you very much. And firstly, greetings to my fellow panelists and uh, to the moderator, and also greetings to everyone joining us from uh, everywhere in the world. Um, cities uh, are, are, are very critical spaces for cultural expression. And uh, I, I think I agree very much with uh, what Rachel was saying in terms of providing critical infrastructure uh, for, for cultural practice and also for cultural content creation, you know. But I think what is more important is also that cities must create an enabling environment, whether it is from a legislative perspective, whether it is from a policy perspective, but also from a, 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 an infrastructure perspective to create that a, a enabling environment for local economic activity to thrive, 
but in particular for cultural and creative the cultural and creative economy uh, to to thrive and and this can be enabled by firstly ensuring that the economy of the city is structured in a way that enables both the creative uh, from creating but also from the residents having the capacity to consume cultural goods and services because if cities are not thriving in a way that enables their residents to have a, a, a firstly an appreciation for local cultural content but also to have you know the necessary resources whether it is the disposable income to consume local goods and services so these are the critical things that cities have to play which are much broader than just what we do on a daily basis within the creative and cultural uh, 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 industries but what we do broadly uh, in how we we, we we craft our cities but african cities have a unique proposition uh, in terms of their their obligation you know and it is because many of our major African cities uh, have a history of colonialism and the architecture of these African cities is such that, you know, it has been for a long time favoring a certain cultural uh, complexion, but also uh, in terms of how economically that cultural expression was happening, was favoring, you know, coloniality. And we have a responsibility to reimagine and change the architecture of our African cities. And it is a, you know, thrust upon us in terms of how we really structure our, our policies uh, to begin to stimulate um, you know, African cities that are more patriotic in terms of their economic output. Uh, and we know that many of our cities have been having economies that are more extractive Many of our resources, whether it is our cultural capital or other economic capital being extracted out of the city and not really benefiting the city. So we have a responsibility to create the consciousness through you know, our creative output uh, that will conscientize uh, you know, policymakers, conscientize residents to ensure that whatever economic output the city generates uh, is, is structured in a way that is more patriotic to the, to the city and its residents. So I think those are some of the things that I think are more important in the way that we, we can position and reposition our cities uh, to be more effective from a cultural perspective. Thank you very much for that, Buisile. Sheila, would you have any perspectives on this from a, a Lagos, West African perspective? What can cities offer in terms of arts, culture, creative industries that differs from what nations can offer? So I would say from a Lagos um, perspective, um, I, when you look at how a lot of the arts and cultures and the major players you find here is really more private driven than, you know, um, city driven. And so I think um, what cities need to do is to support the initiatives that are existing, collaborate, understand, and support. So whether it's financial support, whether it's giving them the necessary um, tools that they need, just having that inroad to understand the creative, the creative sector, the creative economy um, a lot better. We do see a lot of disparity and it affects a lot of the policies that are put in place in Nigeria and Lagos as a whole because there's not that clear understanding so I would say for cities, just support, um, support the initiatives that are being implemented and help them scale. So it's when you're, when you're supporting them, how do they become better? How do you ensure that these initiatives that are being put in place um, actually, you know, become more um, broad and more international over time? Thank you, Sheila. Victor, Africa No Filter supports artists, storytellers, and creatives from across, from around Africa. I'm sure you've got a bird's eye view of the context in which these artists and storytellers are operating and the way in which their cities enable or, or, or disenable their work. Um, what, what is your perspective of how cities differ in terms of the support they can give arts, culture, and the creative industries? Um, thank you so much. Uh, Joma for that question. I love the line you added, disenable, uh, because there's some cities that do disenable, but that's not to say that we don't have cities that enable 
uh, the work of the storytellers. Um, I think uh, I would like to start by saying I agree with everything that has been said already. I'll probably just echo, you know, some of those thoughts and in, in my reflection of uh, our perspectives dealing with African cities and culture. I think for cities to maximize their art and culture space comes down to how the cities themselves perceive, how they relate and how they interpret um, art and culture. Uh, there are a number of tendencies that we've noticed, or I've noticed, um, one of which is that there are cities that work to integrate art and culture into their social fabric. There are those that work to integrate art and culture into the economic fabric of the society. And you've also got cities that work to integrate arts and culture into both the social and the economic fabric of the city and then on the extreme end of that spectrum you've got the cities that don't even care <laughs> and so they don't work to integrate them uh, into um, the social or economic um, 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 permutations but um, I think it, it exists as a spectrum and African cities sit on different aspects of that spectrum even when you have cities that appear like they're integrating um, art and culture into the social fabric of the city. The efforts are usually more ad hoc than mainstream or embedded. Um, for instance, in Nigeria's capital city, I know Sheila is the uh, Lagos expert here. So let me move to Abuja. In Nigeria's capital city, which is Abuja, there's this general feeling that art and culture is neither integrated into the social nor economic fabric of the city. Um, there used to be something called the Abuja Carnival. Those of you who are familiar with Nigeria, um, Abuja Street Carnival was fashioned after the famous Calabar Carnival, which was, uh, which has actually been a very successful, you know, tool in branding the city of Calabar, creating an identity of commonality, social cohesion, uh, stimulating local economy, especially in tourism and hospitality industries, and so on. This Abuja Carnival was fashioned after that. It happened for a number of years, and suddenly. Um, it stopped. The policymakers began to see it as an unnecessary distraction, and then it died a natural death. Right before this call, I had a chat with Joma with one of the prominent craft retailers at the craft village right at the city center in Abuja, and he told me that he's closing shop. Why was he closing shop? He said his profit was barely enough to cover his daily transportation especially with the rise in the cost of petrol, those um, conversant with the issues in Nigeria will understand the last couple of weeks there's been rise in transportation occasioned by rising the cost of petrol and so on. And he's, he, the revenue he makes cannot cover his transportation, let alone you know, become a source of livelihood for him. And so you have a situation where the Abuja craft village is situated right in the city center in a place that is um, quite inaccessible or very difficult to access by public transportation, the regular public transportation. And so you have a situation where these ad hoc efforts that are made to integrate art and culture into the social fabric of the cities are done without a comprehensive thought around the infrastructure that can support the sustainability of these initiatives. So when you add these structural obstacles to other perennial challenges like power supply and access to the internet and multiple taxations and so on, you've created a perfect recipe for stifling creativity in a city. And so you have city administrators um, in a bid to integrate, they rather end up isolating arts and culture within their cities and eventually, you know, it dies off in the city. And so this is just putting it mildly. And so to answer your question or German, rounding up now, um, the approach I recommend is for cities to integrate arts and culture into their social and economic frameworks in order to maximize the benefits of the sector. This means providing infrastructure and the right business models to make the infrastructure and the facilities work, developing policies and an enabling environment, which has also been mentioned already. I know this sounds a bit cliche, but it's the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. We can't run away from it. Uh, there's usually this argument in some African cities that many African cities would prefer to prioritize the basic necessities, services like healthcare, you know, um, education, nutrition, housing, and just generally helping people survive and pulling them out of poverty. But while this may be true, um, I would equally argue that efforts to pull people out of poverty should most likely include supporting small and medium enterprises, many of whom are creative businesses. And so 
my argument is supporting livelihood opportunities in the arts and culture sector is one of the most potent ways of actually putting people out of poverty and creating jobs and so this this is so, sort of a summary and overview of you know um what we've perceived dealing with cities across africa thanks very much victor i i, I think it's really interesting what you talk about the economic potential that the cultural and creative industries provide and i think this is a good time to bring in sheila sheila you you work for lagos state employment trust fund the yes, Lagos State Employment Trust Fund is, it's not a creative industries agency. It's not no. a culture agency. It's an agency that has been set up to build wealth and create jobs in Lagos, right? Mm -hmm. And it provides a really interesting model, I think, of where a whole of government approach can actually stimulate important change or, or activity that highlights the role of culture and creative industries in, in strengthening mm -hmm. a city. Sheila, mm -hmm. talk about that Lagos context and LSETF's role in advancing culture and creative industries without itself mm -hmm. being an instrument of cultural policy. So um, for us at the LSETF, uh, to call for short, um, our focus really is, or our theory of change, as we like to say, is supporting MSMEs to be enablers of job um, creation. So when Victor was talking about some supporting the um, MSMEs, I was nodding my head because that's exactly what um, LSETF was set up for. And we do that through a number of ways. So there's the access to finance, there's the employability trainings and the rest of that. Now, in relation to the, the cultural space, what you do find is, um, as an organization, we support, say, trainings uh, because there's a lot of conversation around creative entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in this space, in the cultural space, and how that can be formalized. And I know Ajoma is very, very familiar with these conversations on formalizing it because it's um, because the way of formalizing these businesses always boils down to tax, right? So how are they going to be taxed and things like that? And so as an agency, what we do is we try to do a lot of dialogue with a lot of engaging with people in the cultural space to say, how can we support the entrepreneurs? When we look at unemployment rates in Nigeria, um, at, officially it's 33.3 percent. Lagos alone is 37.14 percent. However, I know almost a lot of young people play in the cultural space one way or the other and are employed in the cultural space however it's not being captured and so there is a lot of debate on how do we then capture this because i know anytime there is say it's a theater production or film production um you know there's a lot of young people that are hired it's like a gig economy and so you see everybody's then just put under the gig economy or the gig work but it's not really capturing the impact so we do know that, yes, there's a lot of potential in the cultural space. There's a lot of potential and its impacts on GDP. But there has been a lot of struggle in terms of um, formalizing it. And this is where I believe that agencies and, and the government as a whole needs to have a lot of conversation to say, you know, if, if other MSMEs are formalized through taxation, what can we do differently for the cultural space? Because it's very different. But for us at LSCTF, we focus at the moment, we focus a lot on training. So we provide grants to a lot of young people through our employability program. And so they get trainings in filmmaking and other areas in the cultural space um, on for them to be employable. And once they but then what is quite interesting is after they do this training, they then become freelancers. So they're earning income, but we're still not capturing, <laughs> capturing them as employed, right? So we don't have all the answers, but for us as an agency, we've just seen that as our way in supporting these creative entrepreneurs. We've had conversations around providing access to funding. So we used to have a particular fund that was a single digit. So generally we do single digits, which is 9%. But for this particular fund, it was 5% because we wanted to support tourism. We wanted to support, you know, culture, arts and culture in Lagos. Um, but then we got a lot of feedback from major players in the cultural space saying, well, the loan structure wasn't really working for them because of the timing and, and other areas which they flagged. And so it then made us go back to the drawing board to say, how do we then change this 
to ensure that we're providing the support. Do we do the loan structure that we're doing for every other person? Or do we stick to a grant structure? And then how do we track the impact? So there is a lot of um, conversation going on, but I know for us at Lagos through LSETF, through the Ministry of Tourism, um, like the Ministry of Tourism has the Giddy Creative um, Center um, that they have with Ogidi Studios and a lot of initiatives and partnerships with the likes of the Ebony Life, the Terra Cultures. But what you find in these places is these are private sector driven that have been able to convince the government to support them. So the, the players, the players in the private sector will continue to have a major role in ensuring that culture is a major thing for us in Lagos State. And our job as government really is just having a clear understanding because that is usually the major challenge in setting up these policies and enabling environments. And I do agree with Victor and with Ojoma. Sometimes some of these policies are not enabling. <laughs> and, um, and just ensuring that there is a clear understanding of what want, what's needed to be achieved and just not um, looking at it as a hobby. Because again, a lot of our cultural context um, from upbringing. Now it's a lot better. I remember when I was younger, I wanted to be a songwriter. My father did not think that was a job, right? <laughs> so you see that over time, now you have a lot of young people who are doing a lot of stuff in the cultural space. Um, and that's a great thing. So the government needs to catch up to then recognize that this is now a way of creating jobs. This is now a way of building wealth. And how do we ensure that as a country or as a city, we're able to support them better? Thank you so much for that response, Sheila. And you know my views on, on tax. I always say to governments, before you tax, please seek to support and enable. So well spoken there. It's, it's about supporting and enabling and finding ways to really understand what's happening in the sector. I've got a few more questions that I had for the panelists, but there's loads of questions already on Slido. And so actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'll bring in Laya and Longwabo to help us answer those uh, questions that are already coming in. The Slido QR code is on your screen. So if you haven't done it already, do scan the QR and keep those questions coming. Victor, I'm going to ask you about the Creative Vibrancy Index for Africa. You have already talked a little bit about um, the role that you, you see cities play. So could you briefly tell us in, in when we were conceptualizing Creative Vibrancy Index for Africa, why cities, why not countries, for example? Um, okay, thank you so much, Ojoma. And um, I would like to, first of all, commend the British Council and the World, World Cities Culture Forum um, for their contributions to the index. That's a very good question. Well, from a more practical point of view, I think it was more feasible to assess the cultural landscape at city level as opposed to um, country level and um, regional, sub-regional or continental level. Um, I think it made more sense resource-wise and so um, that, that fed into that decision. But another thing that inspired us was the fact that cities are closer administrative units to the citizens uh, compared to regions and countries. And this proximity makes cities uh, better positioned to understand the cultural needs, the peculiarities, uh, and the complexities of social lives of the people who dwell in the cities. And so um, this was a very good factor as well. Uh, cities are uniquely positioned to understand, explore, and apply solutions to most of the challenges we're grappling with in the 21st century, be it poverty, be it inequality, be it unemployment, climate change, and so on. These all are things that feature very prominently you know, at city level, um, as opposed to other levels of um, evaluation. Uh, some of the global development frameworks, um, like the SDGs, I think is the SDG 11, uh, made mention of, or made reference to cities and the importance of cities going forward, uh, identified that more than half of the world's population at the moment live in cities. And I also saw a data somewhere that says by 2050, more than half of Africa's population will also be dwelling in cities. And so it makes cities a very important point of assessment. But very importantly as well, the Africa Union Development Policy Framework, which we all know as um, Agenda 2063, 
also made reference to the role and importance of cities as well. So we can go on and on and point different instruments that pointed us sort of in that direction. But definitely assessing creative vibrancy at higher levels like country and regions wouldn't have given us an objective and practical picture of where the shoe pinches in reality. And so a city level assessment was definitely the way to go for us. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Victor. I would like to invite Laya and Longwabo on screen while we start to take questions from the audience. And I'm going to start with you, Rachel, actually, in terms of audience questions. We've got a question from someone who has not told us their name, but they've talked, they're asking, what can we do to make sure that culture is valued by important decision makers? So Rachel, as both an artist and a decision maker yourself, what can we do to make sure that culture is valued by decision makers? Uh, it's, it's going to take a bit of mindset change. Because in Uganda, for instance, when I was still in school and I loved music to death, I, if we joined the music dance uh, drama department, it was referred to as Musiru Dala Dala, which made very, very stupid. So it's, it's whole generations of getting people to understand how important culture is on you know, gelling the society as an, inc as, as an income stream, as, as, as a way of identity. I, I joined parliament and I'm telling you for sure that when I, when I stand up to speak, everybody is waiting to see what can she even say. You can see it in their eyes. So it's, it's a whole education, education, education. We need to show people how important culture is. In Uganda, we do not even have an independent ministry of, of culture. And a lot of the legal frameworks and the policy frameworks are not in favor of, of, uh, of, of developing culture as, as, a, as a means of an income, as part of our, our sustainability as a society. So we need to educate. And, and, and I'm so privileged to be part of this because I'm seeing so much. I want to learn from Chile. I want to jump to Nigeria and live there and with the organization because all the cities seem to need the private sector to, to start it off. But as a member of parliament, my, my main role right now is to try and create frameworks that will help the people to enjoy music, earn from music. We have the private sector foundation in Uganda. It has got a, a, a sector for the creatives and we are linking up with them to train uh, members of parliament, first of all, because they will be the first to, to, to acknowledge that this law should change. And then we've also got the MasterCard Foundation is also doing a lot of training, but all this is still is private sector led. What I'm struggling to do is to see that government creates this, the, the environment when they finish training, then what? If they come into the city, can they actually work? Is, is, is culture being mainstreamed at every level of governance so that it's recognized every time? At the moment, the artist will be hired to come and gig, and the moment they finish their set, out of the door. No one remembers that they're part of this. So we need a lot of work. Mindset change is the first place to start so that when the, when the policymakers understand how important it is, then the legal frameworks might be changed to favor the ads. 100%. Thank you very much for that, Rachel. Absolutely. Uh, it starts from the mind, doesn't it? In the words of the great sage, we need to emancipate ourselves from the mental slavery that we're in. So that is the first step. Um, we see that there's a question about um, artists at the grassroots perspective. In your first submission, you were talking about um, the way that we need to decolonize the way that our cities respond to arts, culture, and the creative industry. And that within that, there's obviously a strong strand of inclusion and bringing in the other and the margin marginalized. So if you could take this question, somebody is asking, um, how can policymakers better engage with artists to make sure that there is buy-in from a grassroots perspective? I think... Like I said before, we still we need to go down there and sit with people and share with the politicians to understand how important it is to have a creative world 
you know. I, I, I'm at a very big disadvantage because I'm an artist, I understand, and I'm, I'm a school teacher too. I trained as a teacher of music and language. So this has been part of my life forever. So my frustration right now is try to get fellow politicians to own the bandwagon of getting art into our systems. Because when we are culture beings, without culture in us, then the cultural values do not come out. We don't respect them. And I always give this example. At my school, when, when kids come with their parents, they will kneel to greet their parents. But when they come to me, they'll stand up. There's a culture, there's a divide, a divorce between the education system and the, the cultural values. So kids seem to be confused on what is right when. We need this needs to enter into the education system right from the beginning for a child to grow up when they know their language, they know their music, they know who they are. It makes them, uh, the level of self-esteem they get when they understand who they are is a lot better than the kid who grows up, grows up speaking English and then is embarrassed when she goes to the village and can't talk to his relatives. So we, oh, I'm diverting here. Where did we start? <laughs> um, I think that's, that's well said, Rachel. I'll bring in Vusile now. Thank you, Rachel. I'll bring in Vusile to, okay. to also chime in on, on that point about artists in the grassroots. How can we ensure buying from them as well? No, th thank you very much. Uh, I was going to say that the question has got two elements. Uh, the one is about, you know, inclusion and, and, and decolonization, but also what role cities can play at a grassroots level. So I want to start with the, the first one. I have problems with the notions of inclusion and assim assimilation. You know, I think that as African cities, uh, we, we can't want to have African practices being included into the colonial architecture of African cities. We have to deconstruct those uh, identities and, and architecture and construct a new identity for African cities. And yes, it, it may be a gradual and painstaking process, but I think it is a necessary one because, I mean, as natives of African cities, it is important that the dominant uh, cultural practice and even influence should be of the, the natives and, and, and also the, the resultant benefits of that cultural practice should benefit the, the natives. And I think that I also want to emphasize the point that Victor was making about, you know, the role of cities in a, a being mainly focused on physical infrastructure. I think it's also, we have to reimagine the service delivery models of, of cities to also focus on the spiritual infrastructure of the city. You know, and understand that it is as critical as investing in the physical infrastructure of cities. Now, a grassroots a development is a very important area of work that, that is quite necessary. And I think many cities have to really uh, uh, spend a lot of time in talent uh, identification and cultivation, for example, because many of the agencies that operate within cities they want, you know, readily made artists who are ready to enter into the market, but nobody is spending enough time in how we can make sure that we prepare creatives and move them from the margins into the mainstream of the economy. Um, and that is an important area of work where cities can, can intervene. And I think that in the way that we have been operating the city of Johannesburg, we always look at scanning the environment and seeing what is the industry, uh, you know, leading in in terms of interventions to cultivate the cultural and creative industries. And where there is market failure, then we would design interventions and curate them in a way that they become more responsive. And more often than not, we find that those interventions that are lacking are in the grassroots areas. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I like what you said there, Vusili, about the spiritual and the cultural being as important in terms of what art and culture can do. MK Umbugua from Nairobi uh, also thinks so. They say, whereas the economic aspect of creative industries is important, they think that the real value in the investment for culture is to support the well-being of residents, to give them pride in themselves, 
in their cities, in their heritage, and to build resilience to tackle the challenges of the future. So that's you, you were alluding to that there. Um, yes. So thank you. Did and you, also, you just, just a quick point to add there. That there are certain aspects of African culture that will never and should never be for, you know, economic and commercial, you know, packaging. And those, those should be understood for the sacred and spiritual value that they hold and understanding that they are not really for commercial uh, uh, practice. So, and it is important as policymakers that we understand that distinction and we enable, you know, the practice of, you know, cultural uh, and spiritual initiatives that are purely for, uh, for their own merit and not for commercial or economic reasons because those will also have an impact in, in cultivating other forms of economic benefit for the, for, for the cities. Thank you. Absolutely. The, the UNESCO 2005 convention, I think, articulates it well. It talks about dual value of culture, and it says that cultural goods and services should not be subject to the sort of trade liberalization and other types of policies that are being pushed by organizations like the WTO and that are being pushed by globalization. Because culture is not just an economic commodity, it's also the way that we express our identity and our humanity. And so there's the cultural value which should not be subject to the same rules as other commodities as well. Yes. So absolutely. We've got a question specifically about the research. I'll come to you now, Longwabo. Uh, somebody's asking two two questions actually for you if you if you if I may. The first question is: Was there anything that surprised you in the course of the research, uh, Lomwabo? And then on top of that, how can anyone contribute to the research, the reports that's coming out in September? Mm. Um, thank you for that, uh, Odroma. Um, I think for me, what was certainly um, quite surprising in terms of that emerged from the research is with regards to where kind of cultural cultural policies or cultural activities are located within the cities. And what we saw from, from the research is that in different cities, it's, it's located in, in different areas, with an exception of some of the cities that have standalone um, departments of arts and culture. Now that raises a very interesting question around where actually is the best positioning of culture? Should it be permeated across all uh, multiple departments within cities and that uh, culture that enables uh, uh, and, and works within the other kind of uh, departments within cities or could, should it stand by itself and that it has its own programming? And then there's questions around um, uh, if it stands by its own its own department, uh, that there is accountability and there is budget allocations. Whereas if it is spread across the the the, the different departments within uh, cities, it perhaps may be lost in in in, in other pressing matters uh, within the city structures. So that was one of the um, kind of fascinating. Um, uh, points that, that emerged from the research. And I think it's a it's a question that we still need to kind of figure out. And I suppose also policymakers within cities that are that are driving all, all our arts champions uh, to take that up and really kind of expand on that idea. And then with regards to the second um, question around um, how can people participate on the research? Um, we are going to be publish, uh, um, publishing the research publicly in September. So we would welcome any kind of feedback from, 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 from the, public, the general public from there. Sadly, at this point, we've concluded in terms of our data collection, um, data collection process and we had analysis and report writing. But if certainly there is a, a burning point that someone wants to make, we're more than happy to take that uh, forward into our analysis. And they can reach, at, reach us at molo at andani.africa. Uh, molo is M-L-O dot andani.africa. Thank you for that, Lomwabo. We've been talking a lot about cities, and, and I'll bring this question to you, Laya. Um, obviously, it's the World uh, Culture Cities Forum, but someone is asking, does covering cities alone exclude um, rural folks who are a significant majority in Africa? 
Um, I, I don't know about the significant majority, but you get the point of the question. Um, if we cover cities, what's the, the risk in terms of leaving out some people? That's a good question. I mean, we are the World Cities Culture Forum. We work with cities. We work with large cities uh, that identify themselves as creative cities. But of course, these cities don't work in isolation to the rest of their countries or their regions. Or So a lot of the times you'll find that it is, the cities are part of a bigger ecosystem. So they themselves work with outer outer cities with other cities within within their countries so i think what we do is we collate the the collective voice of cities cities in particular have a lot of challenges rapid urbanization brings a lot of challenges to cities and those challenges even though they can be sometimes specific to the region there's a lot of commonalities i mean a lot of what it's really interesting hearing everything that you're saying today because it resonates with a lot of the discussions that we have at, at World Cities Culture Forum. You know, how do we, how do we, someone's talked about the spectrum of, you know, government support and understanding is a big spectrum. How do we nudge that, that governments to understand the role of culture? That's something that all cities across the world are, are, are talking about and, and finding ways. How do we use the data? So we have, there's a lot, even though some of the challenges might be different, there are also a lot of common challenges. And that's why it's interesting to work between cities. But that's not to say that cities themselves then work with their own uh, ecosystems. Thank you very much for that, Leah. Um, and, and I think an interesting or additional point to make in that, as you mentioned, rapid urbanization, I think it's, at the moment it's about half, just under half of Africa lives in cities, about 700 million or so lives in cities. But I think what I also find is in terms of the ecosystem and the supply chains, the manifestation of the work sometimes is in cities, but they're often integrated. Victor was talking about the crafts market, for example, in Abuja, the craft market itself will be located in a city, but the makers are often brought from the sort of more diverse geographical context. But I think it's an important point for us to continue to bear in mind as we as we talk about um, cities and culture. There's quite a, quite a few questions. I'm slowly losing track, so apologies for people with questions. I'm going to try and speed us up a bit because we need to start rounding up. There's a question, should cities think of creative industries policies more generally, or should they be thinking of specific music, fashion, visual arts, and so on policy? So sub-sector specific policies in that regard. Victor, very quickly, what would your response be to that? And what might risks versus benefits be for either approach? Okay, uh, sorry, I was I was um, mute. I think I think it should be a general thing. I mean, um, there's nothing st stopping cities from also going granular and sort of um, looking at it from the different strands. But that could also come with its complexities, and uh, especially when cities have a lot of other structural considerations too. So you, you're, you're juggling so many balls at the same time. So I think at the stage in we find ourselves in our evolution of African cities. I think what would make more sense is to have a cluster approach where you're thinking about the structures, the facilities, the infrastructure, the policies concerning uh, the creative space as a cluster and not necessarily as a, because I think there's also strength in having that economies of scale where you have a cluster, you have a market, you have lots of auxiliary services that also supports that particular uh, creative enterprise within that cluster. So I think it makes a whole lot of sense right now. It, it seems to me that it's going to be more beneficial to approach it, you know, uh, corporately than breaking them down into what we do in music versus what kind of facilities and infrastructure and policy frameworks do we set up to make uh, um, craft integrated into the city. So I think that cluster approach would be better for us. 
Absolutely. And, and we talk about multidisciplinary approaches, right? I remember many, many years ago, um, I, I used to talk to colleagues not based on the continent, and they would talk about this new multidisciplinary way of working. And it used to be so amusing because in an African context, what is music without dance, right? What is, what is performing arts without music? And so that's just the way it is. And I think increasingly with technology and the way that we're now consuming culture, the lines are blurring, I think, between the different sectors. So I'd agree with you, Victor, about the multidisciplinary approach. But talking of, of technology, Letabo Zulu, and I know I have said this wrong because it starts with an X. And before we started, we were talking about South African names that begin with an X and how you should say it. Um, but Letabo is asking, what role do you think that technology can play in the African context in terms of policy progression and preservation of African culture? Buisile, would you like to, to take that? Well, I think, yes, uh, I think if it's a, a, with an X, it would be Tolu, Letabo Tolu. Tolu. Yes, Tolu, yeah. <laughs> so um, for me, techno technology plays an important role, uh, but I also think that we, we, we have to understand technology much more broad, broader than, uh, you know, just modern technology because indigenous ways of production are also technology. Uh, and I think our technology strategies have to be all inclusive in terms of how we define them. Um, but technology, modern technology in a sense, plays an important role. And I think it also places a huge pressure on cities to, 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 to be more dynamic in terms of their policy and practices and in terms of their interventions in building particularly an understanding of the legal and financial implications of transferring from, you know, analog ways of uh, uh, packaging and presenting and distribution of cultural content to more digital ways of, of doing so. Um, and, and I think that it, th there is a whole lot of education that is required there. There's a whole lot of understanding of building also intermediary enterprises that will begin to absorb the pressure from creatives, from being experts in understanding technology and understanding the legal uh, implications, understanding how to market their own work. So there's there's a whole lot of uh, other enterprise, enterpri enterprising opportunities that are emerging within the value chain because there's 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 other sub elements of the value chain that that technology forces us to to introduce. And I think that it is important also to strike a balance uh, that African cities must not just be uh, quick to conform to the changing environment in Western cities because, I mean, they have the benefit of having, uh, you know, invested so much more in their infrastructure that uh, we, we shouldn't be, uh, you know, feeling pressured to move at the same speed. And, and if... Uh, you know, certain ways of distributing cultural content that may be viewed as archaic work for us. I think we must still stick to that until we feel that we are ready to, to really present our content in a different platforms. So that, that for me is, is, is just the way that I think we, and we can start developing on our, our own platforms because the questions of ownership and control around, you know, a digital platforms is one that Africa African cities are really disadvantaged and also by extension, African creatives also then feel the brand, you know, because they can't maximize uh, the commercialization of their cultural content. So those are some of the things that I think are important considerations in the technology space. Absolutely. I think you raised a really important point about not just copying blindly. And there's a question about that that I'll come to in a second. But when we were doing the indicators to measure creative vibrancy in African cities, one of the things that we were really um, um, focused on and we're really keen to do was we need to think about consumption of culture in an African context. What does that look like? It may not be galleries or museums in the way that you have in the global north. So what does that look like? 
And so in our context, we were looking at public space, we were looking at festivals, we were looking at online consumption in a way that we know differs from various other places where cultural vibrancy has been measured, where those things have not been considered. So absolutely. I'll, I'll come to you, Sheila. I know that Lagos State has quite a developed strategy and policy around growth and um, the creative industries and tourism and so on. And there's a question here about how African cities are innovating opportunities for their specific context rather than emulating systems from the global north. How how would you say Lagos State has has managed to do that? So I would say for Lagos State, there's been a lot of emphasis on collaboration. Um, what you find is that what I would say what I do love is over time a lot of major players in the cultural space have been very vocal about what needs to be done and just sort of contributing to establishing these policies. Now, the challenge is usually in the implementation. However, you find that there's a lot of conversation that does happen. Um, so you do find, just looking at the, the broad spectrum of things, you do find that, yes, as a, as a state, Lagos State, or Lagos City specifically, you find that there is a vast, it's, it's very diverse, right? Um, and so when you do find a lot of opportunities that are given, you'll find that it's more on a cultural, it's more on a broad scale, like a cultural scale, as opposed to being specialized. And then when you look at it in terms of innovation, I know most recently there's been a lot of conversation around comics, right? So our, um, our animation, um, a lot of um, things about being able to talk about our culture through animation, being able to have, I mean, there's, I, I think it was Magic Carpet, I might be wrong, there's another production company that did something on Queen Amina, and so now you find that a lot of players, again, from the private sector, who are able to get funding. So either they're getting funding from the likes of Africa No Filter or from the British Council, you find that they're getting funding to tell better stories. Um, technology and digital media has played a huge role as well in ensuring that innovation. Um, you find that um, a few years ago, our content wasn't really exportable. Yes, we did have a few here and there, a few dance groups. You had Fela, you had, you know, a lot of that that was exportable. But now you see that you can be... Either I'm lost or we've lost Sheila there. Um... If you guys can hear me, thumbs up. Here, viewed globally. Sure. Oh, okay. I want to be sure if I was back on. <laughs> okay. Sorry. 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 Yes. Sorry. So you do find so you do find that you can be here in Lagos and that your content or whatever it is, whether it's an exhibition or anything that you're doing, is being consumed globally. In the last few years, we have the likes of Art X. There's so much that has happened in the cultural space in Lagos, and it almost feels like Lagos is the sort of like the melting pot of culture um, in Nigeria. So I would say that from a policy angle, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of implementation. Um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in better collaboration and understanding of, and I'm, I'm really grateful to the likes of British Council because British Council has done a lot of work in bringing culture to the forefront. So I know the British Council was a huge supporter of the Lagos Theatre Festival for a very long time, to which I provided a lot of smaller production companies to be able to um, have stage plays. So I was one of those little production companies a, a long time ago where I had like my own stage plays, right? But the likes of the British Council were able to bring culture to the forefront. And so because of that, you now have more people talking about culture, talking about the work that is being done. And I, I was listening to Vuyasile when he was talking about the grassroots. Um, there is a lot of work that actually needs to be done there as well. And that's a whole different conversation with, the, with when it comes to colonization and how it has impacted the way we consume um, culture and how we have this gentrified, <laughs> gentrified um, cultural elements that we have at the moment. But that's a whole different conversation. So just looking at, just rounding off now, just looking at innovation, um, Lagos has done a lot of work. 
we still have a lot of a lot more work to do but um in terms of innovating we have learned so much just even just look at the pandemic and what the pandemic did to the cultural sector um and so one of the things you will find about lagos and re lagos residents is just the fact that they are always inventing they are always looking at other ways to do things and um the government in its own capacity can support but there needs to be a lot more support from the government absolutely thank you sheila we've now run out of time we've got five minutes to go there's a question from richard um at ecomos asking is it time that the UN has an 18th SDG as was once intended that looks at the role of tangible and intangible cultural and cultural heritage? And I would say, Richard, uh, I think we would all agree that the answer to that question is yes. On that note, I'd like to ask the final question of Laya. Somebody from Abuja is asking, um, what is the potential for a city like Abuja to join the WCCF? as they think there's a lot of potential for growth. Laya, do you want to answer that question briefly? Come and talk to us. Come and talk to us. We love Abuja. We love Abuja. We love Lagos. We love Abuja. So, yeah, come and talk to us. Okay, cool. So the answer to that person is do get in touch with WCCF, World C uh, Culture Cities Forum. Um, we've run out of time. Apologies for those whose questions we couldn't get to. Um, we've heard uh, now from everyone, Vuyisile, Sheila, Victor, Longwabo, Rachel, and of course, Leia, on the opportunities for cities to play a stronger role in supporting with cultural infrastructure, supporting with ensuring the role of culture, not just as an economic vehicle, but also as a cultural and spiritual and religious vehicle, as Vuyisile has mentioned. And we've talked about the fact that um, there are opportunities both to focus on culture as a standalone thing in its own right, as well as to consider it in the context of other things like economic development, like in the case of LSCTF, but also urban regeneration, as well as youth development and engagement. I've had a good time. I don't know about you guys from the 93 cities that have dialed in, um, but I've, I re I'm really grateful to you all. Also grateful to Andani, the British Council, and WCCF for, for this opportunity to have this really exciting conversation. I'm now going to pass back to you, Laya, to close us off and end the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone. I think, La, it's, I mean, Ojuma, you've done quite good takeaways. For me, the takeaways are, you know, 13 of 20 of the largest cities will be in Africa. Uh, we've talked about this integration of culture in the economic, social, spiritual role of culture in uh, creating identity. Uh, we've talked about the importance of supporting existing projects and scaling them up, taking the artists from the margin into the mainstream. We've talked about the role of digital tools and technology. We've talked about innovation. We've talked about how to adapt existing policies to fit the needs of uh, creative entrepreneurs and freelancers. Sometimes we already have the policies. We just have to adapt them. Uh, we've talked about the importance of data and evidence. And I think for me, my takeaway is there's so much energy. There's so much happening in African capitals. And you're right, it's not about replicating. You will find your own solutions. You are innovating. And we can all learn from you as well. So we want to, you to come into, into dialogue with us so we can all uh, learn from each other. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Over 130 people from 93 different cities across the world. You will be able to watch this uh, video and this session on YouTube, and it will be in English and French captions as well. Uh, we will post the research slides that Lonuabo has kindly presented today. They will be on our web website. And for uh, World Cities Culture Forum, we will continue to work with the cities that we've been in touch with and more with the British Council, with Andani Africa, with Africa No Filter and others. For example, there's a fantastic project called the Mayor's Dialogue that brings together mayors in Africa with mayors in Europe. We'll continue to work with them. That's all for today. 
all I have to say now is remember to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Thanks to all the panelists, Sheila, Stella, Victor, Rachel, Vizili, Ojoma. Thank you to all the citizen collaborators for the research. We couldn't have done it without you. And finally, least, last but not least, thank you to Skinda and all the team at British Council. And thank you at World Cities Culture Forum team, in particular, Sierra and Catherine, who have worked behind the scenes to make this possible. Thank you all and goodbye from London. Wow, well done.